Hi, this is John Potter and welcome to Leadership in Action. This is session one and in this session we're going to have a look at the roots and the development of thought on leadership. Hi, this is John Potter and welcome to Leadership in Action. This is module one of a series of ten modules looking at the practical sides of leadership and how we can all be more effective in leadership positions, particularly at the front line or team level. This is a series of ten modules and the first module that we will shortly be starting is about the roots of leadership and how thought on leadership has developed up to our current time. Module 2 is about the qualities, traits and situational approach to leadership and Module 3 is looking at the whole area of behavioural approaches to leadership based on some of the research carried out in the United States of America in the 1960s. Then Module 4 looks at action-centred or functional leadership which is a, an approach to leadership that was developed in this country in the UK and then Episode 5, Module 5 is about effective team leadership. Module 6 is about how we can be more effective as change leaders and Module 7 covers some of the ideas about what leaders have to handle in terms of the different types of problems and how they can make decisions more effectively. Module 8 is about unlocking human potential, a very important part of what modern leaders do. And then Module 9 is about emotionally intelligent leadership, a critical issue in the modern organisation. And then finally, Module 10 is about creating the foundation for both operational and strategic leadership. So let's get started on Module 1, the roots and development of thought on leadership. So let's think about the roots of leadership. Many people think that the study of leadership is a new subject. In fact, it's the study of management that's a relatively new subject because that started at the beginning of the 20th century when mass production started to come about. So it's difficult to define exactly when considered thought on leadership started, but ancient Greece is quite a useful entry point, particularly as early thinking was towards leadership in government, leadership in the military world and in politics. And one of the great thinkers on leadership was Socrates, and he identified a number of leadership capabilities which today we might term competencies, and these actually appear on the next slide. But before we move on to that, let's talk about Xenophon, who was one of Socrates' followers. He put the leadership ideas into the leadership and the battlefield. He was a military leader and very keen to be an effective military leader. And then, of course, Plato, in a very philosophical way, defined and identified some really key issues about the nature of leadership, particularly in the maritime setting, and we'll explore what his thoughts were in that area. And we'll look at all three sets of these ideas in the next three slides, just to really set the foundation for our discussion on leadership. However, before doing so, it is worth remembering that Socrates paid dearly for his efforts to study leadership because such work was taken very much as a criticism by the government of the day. In fact, Socrates was taken to court and attempted to argue his way out of the situation but failed to do so. It appears, ultimately, that he committed suicide by taking hemlock because he got into such a mentally disturbed state about being persecuted by the government for looking at leadership. And it does point to the fact that being involved in the study of leadership and attempting to make sense of current leaders can be a dangerous occupation in some organisations, political situations and, of course, countries. There has always been a close link, of course, between leadership development and selection in the military world, because obviously leaders often get killed in battle. Thus, leadership succession is key to maintaining an army or another military organisation, and the word strategy comes from the ancient Greek word of stratos, which means an army or a large body of people, and dg, this means to lead. So let's now see what capabilities and competencies leaders should possess and display according to Socrates. But before we do that, what we'd like you to do is to ponder on the following study question. What differences do you think you can identify in a military type of situation from a normal business situation or a public, private or third sector situation? Just think about that before moving on. <laughs> 
So let's look at slide 3 which looks at the strategic leadership skills identified by Socrates. Now Socrates displayed some very clear thinking with his leadership skills and today we might call these capabilities or competencies. He focused on selecting the right person or the right individual for a task and using in what today's psychological terms we would call operant conditioning or behaviour reinforcement in encouraging people to stop displaying negative or bad behaviour and encouraging good behaviour using punishment and reward systems. Now our ideas today of what constitutes appropriate punishment for bad behaviour probably very different from Socrates day. However we do see reward and punishment or what we term carrot and stick techniques used extensively as part of many people's leadership and management style. And the issue of hearts and minds is addressed in Socrates' set of leadership capabilities and the idea of winning the goodwill of the people under the leader, the people who report to the leader, and also the process of building a network of allies and helpers is identified as being important. And of course, keeping what the leaders gained may be said to be one of the key foundation principles of what today we call risk management. And it's very clear from Socrates' list that leaders need to work hard both in terms of activity and goal achievement. Finally, the idea of the leader being technically and professionally competent presented. This is reflected through the development and thought of thought of what we call today sustainable leadership and one of the ideas in sustainable leadership is that authority flows to the one who knows and we'll be seeing this again and again throughout our, our, our study into the subject of leadership. So before moving on to the next slide please give some thought to the following study question. So how appropriate do you think Socrates' leadership skills, capabilities and competencies are to the world in which we live today, particularly in the business environment? So now let's move on to slide 4 and have a look at Xenophon's legacy. Xenophon was a follower of Socrates and apparently wrote down much of what Socrates talked about, something which of course Socrates himself didn't do. Xenophon's approach to military leadership is covered very well in John Adair's book Effective Strategic Leadership in Chapter 1 and although this book is primarily aimed at the strategic level of leadership it does provide a very useful grounding in the roots of leadership particularly in the military context. Xenophon points to the importance of leading from the front of technical and professional competence and sharing the risks and hardships with the followers. He also focuses on what we might call the roots of emotionally intelligent leadership, something we're going to talk about later in this series, realising that human beings are emotional creatures and that inspiration plays an important part in leadership, particularly in difficult times. Part of the inspirational approach is reminding people of the higher purpose of their efforts, something Xenophon did. And he also set the scene for the distinction between leaders working to achieve tasks and in satisfying the needs of the followers. This is covered in more depth in uh, Module 3 on behavioural leadership. In today's language, however, Xenophon points to the people issues in terms of being firm and fair, showing humanity and being visible. All three factors of which are sometimes missing in today's world in many organisations. So, before moving on to the next slide, please give some thought as to how you would answer the following study question. Do you think that Xenophon's approach to leadership is solely relevant to the military environment, or does it have possible applications to today's public, private and third sector environments? Now let's move on to slide 5, Plato's thoughts on leadership. And I quote, let's read this quote because it's quite complex. The sailors are quarrelling over the control of the helm. They do not understand that the genuine navigator can only make himself fit to command a ship by studying the seasons of the year, sky, stars and winds, and all that belongs to his craft. And they have no idea that, along with the science of navigation, it is possible for him to gain, by instruction or practice, the skill to keep control of the helm, whether some of them like it or not. 
Well, that's a pretty complex statement about leadership. And of course, Plato, as we might expect, was much more philosophical about leadership, and his thoughts encapsulated on this slide reinforce his position as a key thinker, albeit a complex one. Well, the essence of this slide, if we unpack it, is that to be an effective leader, it's important that the leader understands his or her environment that they study the professional nature of the work that he or she has to undertake, and that, by gaining the necessary skills and knowledge, it may set them apart from the followers, and even create some dislike on the part of some of the followers. This leads to the modern idea of leadership distance, a variable created by the leader being better qualified by knowledge, skills and experience, so setting them apart from the followers. Well, before moving on to the next slide, how would you answer the following study question? To what extent should a leader be able to perform any task that his or her followers undertake to an equal or better standard? In this slide, slide 6, we start to think about moving through the ages and how thought on leadership actually developed. And although leadership obviously did evolve through the centuries following the world of ancient Greece, it did tend to be associated with toughness and military situations together with power in terms of politics and government. In today's terms, many old world leaders would probably have been seen as toxic leaders, those leaders who behavior tends to produce dysfunctional effects on individuals, teams, organizations and sometimes whole political systems and countries. And to have a look at a little bit more depth on psychological thought on toxic leaders, I would refer you to Gene Lippmann's article on the allure of toxic leaders, which you can get through a Google search using Gene Lippmann Blumen toxic leaders. The idea of leading through fear seem to have lasted for many centuries and even in today's modern workplace it's not uncommon to find examples of leaders who bully their followers and thus create the effects of a toxic leader. So leadership was often about toughness, strong character, charisma and other qualities which are often difficult to define. We'll explore that in the next module. Tough leadership often equates to today's term of toxic leadership and we should always remember the quote, the quote from the Pirates of the Caribbean, I think it was. The floggings will continue until morale improves. You do not get effective performance from people by frightening them in the long term. So, before you move on to the next slide, please give some thought to the following study questions. Firstly, have you encountered any toxic leaders in the various job roles you've held? And secondly, if so, what were the effects that they produced and how did you handle their behaviour? In this slide, slide 7, we're moving on to the 20th century. We're going to talk a little bit about the great man approach to leadership, the qualities approach, leadership traits and the challenges posed by these ideas, the great man and the qualities approaches. At the turn of the 20th century, the great man theories prevailed, although it has to be said, particularly in today's politically correct world, that this is something of a misnomer. What we're really referring to is the great person approach, because throughout history there's been a wide range of effective female leaders, including Elizabeth I and many others. The idea of the great person was that in terms of leadership, some people had it and some didn't. In many cases, it was suggested that people were born to lead, were encouraged to take leadership positions by their social upbringing and school environment, and that leadership was inherited rather than developed. Whilst this approach is appealing to many on a superficial level, it's got many problems. Firstly, it underplays the importance of technical and professional knowledge, which earlier observers such as Socrates, Xenophon and Plato had identified. In some cases, including the military, it led to the concept of the buffoon leader, who people would follow for reasons of position and rank rather than belief in the leader's ability to operate effectively as a leader. There were many attempts to identify specific leadership traits or characteristics, and these included such factors as courage, enthusiasm, stamina, 
physical fitness, humility, and so forth. And the identification of such traits is a highly subjective process with little scope for accurate measurement. Also, the qualities and traits approach on its own tends to lead to stereotyping problems where people who are engaged in leadership selection tend to favour candidates who are like themselves. And there's little agreement on the definitive set of leadership qualities and traits, although many lists of similar institutions such as military or police academies have listed those traits which tend to be the things that they look for. The thing is, it's very difficult to measure leadership qualities and even more difficult to develop specific qualities to order, although it has to be said that the subjective view of leadership quality is still firmly held by many people on the basis that leadership potential is difficult, if not possible, to reduce to scientific terms. Thus, the world of leadership study moved on to consider the importance of the situation to the leader's effectiveness as well as the so-called qualities. So before considering that aspect, however, please give some thought to the following study questions. To what extent do you think that leaders are born rather than made? And secondly, how does your answer impact on the idea of leadership development? So now let's move on to the situational approach. In slide 8 we talk about the person and the situation. Well we could start off looking at this by saying that one person's heaven is another person's hell. Situations that work for some leaders don't work for others. And there is a very interesting bit of sort of pseudo-mathematical stuff that says that leadership effectiveness equals the product of the person and the situation. So leadership isn't necessarily transferable with total success from one environment to another. And, particularly for the military, successful combat leadership does not always convert well to successful lead civilian leadership or leadership in other situations. <laughs> so, let's just think about this. Many writers on leadership, such as Warren Bennis and John Adair, have pointed out the importance of this interaction of the leader and the situation. And a situation in which one leader may excel may be seriously career-limiting for another person. It's often been said that leadership effectiveness is this product of the person and the situation. And, as we've already said, we can represent this in a pseudo-mathematical form as LE equals P times S. What works in one context, say a military culture, may not work so well in another culture, say a bank something that ex-service personnel have to consider when leaving the strongly defined and controlled culture of the military. In particular, the attributes of a leader in combat could well be interpreted as toxic in a civilian environment. So give some thought to the following questions before moving on to the next slide. How can you identify the required leadership skills of a military leader? Can you do that? If so, how well do you think those would translate to the civilian environment? This slide, The Scientific Approach to Leadership, introduces what we're going to be looking at in a bit more detail in Module 3. Two key names come to light in this particular scientific approach. Ralph Stogdill, based at the University of Ohio in America, and he came up with four factors related to leadership and what leaders did. We'll look at these in Module 3 in a bit more detail. But they boil down basically to relationship issues and task issues. And then the University of Michigan again came up with four different factors, which in again actually boiled down to the same thing, relationship and task issues. So this was in the 1960s, and quite a lot of research into leader behavior was carried out in a number of American universities, and Ohio and Michigan seem to be two of the most notable. Ralph Stogdill was a key researcher at Ohio, and he identified a number of leadership issues, and using a process allied to factor analysis, these factors were reduced to the four key issues of consideration, sensitivity, production emphasis, and initiating structure. And these in turn were reduced to two key areas, relationship behavior and task behavior. Likewise, the University of Michigan studies focused on four factors, this time support, interaction facilitation, goal emphasis, 
and work facilitation, which again reduced to the idea of relationship or people behaviour and task behaviour. Thus, the task relationship behavioural mix was identified. And in group psychology, there's also the concept of successful groups having a socio emotional leader and a task leader, which gave added credibility to the idea of leaders displaying two clusters of behaviour. So, give some thought and give your answers to the following study question before moving on to the next slide. Study question is this Can you identify three leaders, one of whom is task orientated? one of whom is relationship orientated and one of whom is balanced between task and relationship orientation. Give that some thought and we'll speak in the next slide. So now we move on to the idea of follower needs, the functional approach to leadership or action-centered leadership as it's sometimes called. This is slide 10 and this is an alternative approach to task and relationship behaviours. Three sets of needs are looked at. The needs of the task, the team and the individual. The needs are satisfied by the leader carrying out a number of functions including planning, briefing and so forth as we'll look at in more detail in module 4. Whilst the US Department of Defense was engaged in expensive scientific studies of leadership behavior, in the UK little in the way of resources were available for such study, and writing on the topic of leadership tended to be anecdotal, highly subjective, and relatively unscientific. A key figure in the UK in the 1960s was Professor John Adair, who was my predecessor at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. And John Adair proposed three sets of needs relating to the task needs, the needs of creating a team, and the needs of remembering that individuals exist in teams, all with their individual strengths and weaknesses. And in so doing so, John Adair presented a model of leadership where the focus was two-thirds on people, and one-third on the task, as opposed to the equal emphasis of many of the American models. The additional focus of splitting the people aspect into the team and the group and into individual aspects was a key part in making John Adair's functional approach to leadership development, particularly at the team and front-line levels, a great success. In particular, it proposed that anyone could acquire a set of leadership functions focused on the followers needs rather than simple leadership behaviors and so move up the scale of leadership competence. The other important issue about the functional or action-centered leadership approach is that the functions relate to both leadership and management behaviors rather than simply to leadership behaviors as do many of the American models. And we'll look in greater depth at John Adair's work in Module 4. Before we move on to the next slide though, please think about the next study question. In your own experience as a leader, would you say you put effort into satisfying all three needs of task, team and individual areas, or are you perhaps biased, say towards satisfying task needs at the expense of team or individual needs? So let's pull this all together. Let's talk about the composite approach to leadership. In the late 1980s and the early 1990s, there were many, many leadership models produced, and none was suitable for all situations or all leaders. And the composite approach pulled together many models currently being explored. The bottom line of the composite approach was in transforming people and unlocking their potential. So these leadership theories and models really did proliferate in the late 1980s and on into the 1990s, partly because of the rate of change that many organizations were experiencing. It seemed almost to be exponential. The Berlin Wall was dismantled, technology, computers and communications were advancing at a great rate, and the level of complexity with which leaders were having to deal seemed to be growing, growing exponentially. And in an attempt to pull together the increasingly complex world of leadership models, I created the concept of composite leadership around 1987, which recognized that no one leadership model suited every leader at every level, 
but that the common element was that leaders should work towards transforming their people's performance and unlocking their potential. The concept of transactional versus transformational leadership had already been identified by Bernard Bass, and one of the constructs of the composite approach to leadership was that transactional and transformational leadership could coexist rather than being mutually exclusive. So transformational leadership is all about unlocking potential. Transactional leadership is all about people just performing according to their contract of employment, just doing what they need to do to get paid. And instead of those being at opposite ends of a spectrum, we now assume that we can actually have a leader who is both transactional and transformational at the same time. And this idea of unlocking potential was something that was reflected in the work of Peter Senge back in the early 90s when he defined the leader's new role as about creating the leading organization in terms of learning. So before we move on to the next slide, what I'd like you to do is to think what do you understand by transformational leadership and do you think it can exist effectively with transactional leadership? Well, moving on to emotionally intelligent leadership in slide 12, uh, it's important to realize, I think, that although many approaches to leadership have acknowledged the importance of vision and inspiration, few writers acknowledged the emotional side of the process. And Daniel Goleman proposed the five essential elements of emotional intelligence, that is, understanding your own emotions, managing your own emotions and harnessing them, understanding other people's emotions, and then handling relationships effectively. And we're going to explore this now and in a later module. Emotion has always been linked privately with leadership, but often not admitted publicly, as it was felt for many decades and centuries that leaders have to be strong, invulnerable and not prey to the negative impact of emotions. Studies of soldiers in battle and other people in difficult situations have shown that human beings are very emotional and that effective leaders seem to have an emotional side as well as an intellectual impact on individuals. And in the 1990s, Daniel Goleman promoted the concept of emotional intelligence and has moved his thinking towards what he calls primal leadership, which puts forward the argument that a great deal of leadership effectiveness takes place at a visceral rather than a logical level. Goleman's approach to emotional intelligence takes account of five issues. Firstly, understanding your own emotions is key. And once you understand those emotions, managing your own emotions is very important as a leader. Harnessing emotions to create motivation in yourself and in others. And then understanding other people's emotions and handling relationships effectively. These are the five key areas of emotional intelligence. And in a later module, we'll look at the impact of leadership styles on the climate of an organization and identify four leadership styles which seem to produce a positive emotional impact and two styles which seem to produce a negative impact on the climate of the organization. And we'll also discuss toxic leadership in a bit more detail, which is, if you like, the opposite to emotionally intelligent leadership. And we'll do this in a later module. So our study questions now are, to what extent do you feel that you are an emotionally intelligent leader? And secondly, can you identify two leaders who you have encountered who were emotionally intelligent and two who were not? In slide 13, we're going to introduce the idea of sustainable leadership, which takes account of the changing world in which we live and the impact of change on leadership action and six factors that leaders need to take into consideration if they're going to be sustainable. Complexity, commitments, connectedness, culture, context and capabilities. Well the word sustainability has a number of associations ranging from so-called green issues regarding our planet through to organizations handling change effectively and indeed leaders being able to maintain credibility as the tasks they have to handle change. In the context of this module we are considering the factors that enable a leader to sustain leadership credibility.
and these factors include the ability to handle complexity, being clear on the issues to which the leader and the organization is committed, connectedness in terms of building long-term relationships, understanding and being able to impact on organizational culture, understanding the context of the organization and working towards developing the capabilities of both the people and the systems within the organization. And these factors are based on the four C's concept of David Wheeler which he proposed in the early 2000s with the addition of two extra factors relating to sustainable leadership. So in terms of thinking about this idea of sustaining leadership how would you answer the following study questions? Firstly, to what extent do you take into account those six factors which it is suggested promote sustainable leadership? And do you think those factors are time dependent? That is, would they have been the same during the middle of, say, the 20th century and will they still be relevant in the middle of the 21st century? Our final area of thinking about the development of thought on leadership is shown in slide 14 when we think about leadership in a multicultural setting, that is global leadership, leadership that works around the planet, whatever national culture you're involved in, whatever part of the world you're operating in. And tomorrow's company have produced a very, very interesting report that identifies a number of very, very key issues. With increased communication ability and the growth in international operations of many organizations, particularly transnational ones, it's often the case that a leader may have to operate in cultures other than her or his own. And the concept of the global leader, an individual who can operate effectively in a multicultural environment and one different from her or his own national culture is a growing area in leadership study. And tomorrow's company have produced a very interesting recent report which identified some of the characteristics which appear to be transferable across different national and organizational cultures. As with many leadership models, the importance of vision, having a strong set of values, having personal qualities such as courage, and empathy, seeing things from other people's viewpoints are important. At the same time, leaders need to be accessible and increasingly they need high level negotiating and interpersonal skills. There has to be a passion for teamwork, including at the top team level, and yet at the same time they need to have humility, reflecting some of the ideas of Jim Collins' Level 5 leadership perhaps. Leaders need to have a commitment to developing future leaders taking a global view rather than a stereotypical view of what they think would just work in their one country and leaders have to be wider and deeper in their business focus than perhaps has been the case in the past and they need to be multi-generational they need to think about the young the medium and the more elderly individuals in society and finally above all they need to be true to the core values of the organization and of course all this involves a high degree of emotional intelligence and attention to leadership succession. So your final study questions are these. Firstly, how well do you think these factors relate to the leadership position in which you may be operating at present? Do you believe that these factors will work in different cultures and countries? And then do you feel that any factors are missing? Finally, to finish off Module 1, a few words about the bibliography in slide 15. Ralph Stockdale's Handbook of Leadership is still a very, very powerful text. Uh, he originally wrote it in 1974 and he does update it pretty regularly. So you might like to do a Google search to see the latest edition. John Adair's Strategic Leadership, Effective Strategic Leadership book of 2002 provides a great introduction to the development of thought on leadership and to strategic leadership in its widest sense. And then David Surrett's Frontiers of Leadership gives a good overview of the subject. One of the more recent books on leadership by Richard Daft, published by Cengage, is an excellent summary of a whole range of stuff to do with leadership.
Warren Bennis in 1989 produced a great book called On Becoming a Leader. And you might like to have a look at The Managerial Grid by Mouton and Blake, um, published in 1968. The Tomorrow's Company Report, published in 2010. Very good reading. And then Daniel Goleman's book on the new leaders by Goleman, Boyatzis and Annie McKee. Finally, a Harvard Business Review article by Jim Collins on Level 5 Leadership is very interesting because it kind of takes the emphasis away from the Lone Ranger on the White Horse type of leadership, the sort of charismatic superstar CEOs that we saw in the 90s, and it talks about the combination of willpower and humility. So that's it for Module 1. Have a look at some of those references. Think carefully about the study questions and I'll look forward to talking to you and with you in Module 2. Thank you.